Okay, so we are starting chapter six, ladies. Chapter six, the second to last chapter. So just to give us a little bit of a sense of where we are in the book. So up until now in chapter, we finished chapter five and the, we were talking about the before and after, right? Before trust, after trust. We're doing a, he was doing a compare and contrast where we could see ourselves how we would have been how, or how we were without the trust and how we are or how we would be when we have trust. And the last um, the last of those was this element of being dissatisfied, dissatisfied versus satisfied. And when he wrapped up that um, that tendency or that before and after, that those qualities of being dissatisfied versus satisfied, he talked about, he used an example of a person that, um, that's, that has the mindset of when God gives me what I want and what I need, right. For my, my food to provide for my food and other needs. And also for those people that I'm responsible for my wife and children for their entire lives, then I'm going to be, then I'm going to be free to actually focus on my divine service. Then I will pay attention. I'll pay my responsibilities to my creator. And I'm going to think about that side of my responsibilities, but only when he gives me that, right? Because be, until he gives me that, I have to be really focused on that. This is, you know, this person thinks that this is, this is something that he needs to get right now. And then once he gets it, then that's going to free him um, to actually be able to dedicate his life, right? To his creator. Now, what the author is going to do, so he closed chapter five, giving us that that angle of the dissatisfied person. This person is not satisfied to the extent that he makes such a ludicrous claim. And now what the author is going to do in chapter six, which we're going to start today, I don't know if we're going to cover the entire chapter today, but maybe, we'll see, I doubt it. Um, what he's going to do in chapter six is he is going to debunk this. He's going to refute this ludicrous claim and he's going to give us the reasons, the, the 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 way to refute this this claim. Okay, so this whole chapter is actually a very interesting chapter. Um, I think it's a fabulous chapter, and it's all debunking or refuting this security mentality. Meaning, you give me first, give me collateral, and then I'll take care of what you need, Hashem, what you need from me, God, right, or what you've put me in the world to to do then we'll talk about that but right now just make sure that i'm i i need to be taken care of not just me but like i said before and like I, like he said at the end of chapter five um those who i'm responsible for my entire life plus the people i'm responsible for for the in, their entire life so before we read it inside because even though this is actually a beautiful chapter the language can throw us a little bit off kilter and kind of like we can get a little bit lost in the language of security and collateral and all of these things. I'm going to give us a an overview as I try to do always to just kind of like to help us that when we're reading it inside the text, we know what is happening and to prevent us from getting lost. And so that everything like Tavia said one day kind of gels. Oh, and also we should, um, we should mention that we're doing today's learning um, for the Rafua Shlema of Miriam Devora Abbas Nechama Braina and Rafael Naftali Ben um, Hanat Sivia. And in memory of uh, Shaltiel Yoel Ben Moshe Yehuda and Miriam Baz Mordechai. Okay, so now let's do the summary of chapter six. So basically what I just described to, to you ladies right now is what we call, at least in my home, the show me the money mindset, right? This person has this, you remember from whatever, what was that? Jerry Maguire, right? The guy's like, show me the money, right? That's what this guy's doing here. He's saying to Hashem, show me the money, right? He's negotiating with Hashem in his mind, right? Saying, give me everything in advance. Give me my material wealth in advance. And then someday, someday maybe I'm going to get around to serving you, Hashem, right? And he's, so he's asking for this collateral. He's asking for this, he's taking this pledge in advance, Okay. Again, give me something first, and then I'll give you something second. So um, give me collateral, right? And then I'll get, th then I'll repay you. So now the author is going to say, okay, what is wrong with this mentality? What is, what is the mistake here? And he's going to give us seven ways 
how this is completely ludicrous. Okay. Number one, the first problem. Oh, look, Alex is here. Good. Welcome. The first problem, um, the first problem with this show me the money mindset is that I am actually doubting Hashem's strength and his ability to provide me for my needs, right? Like th that's, that's exactly what I'm saying, right? I'm saying you're not going to, you're not going to be able to provide me or in, in the event that you can't provide me, just show it to me now. And then we'll talk about everything else later. So the first, the first, the, the first way to refute this is, 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 is what we call what I like to call and so that we have sticky language to remember these things is just think about it as your boss. If you went to your boss and you said, well, I don't trust that you're going to be paying, going to pay me at the end of my month of work. So give me the money now and then I'll serve you. Right. Or imagine a servant who would do that to his master. Right. That's not the way we do things. Right. Meaning the, it, it, it's, it's, you wouldn't demand pay in advance from your boss, right? You wouldn't demand them to give you an advance. How could you demand advance pay from your creator, right? It sounds pretty ridiculous when we think about it, right? The second argument that he's going to give us is what, so the first one is the boss, right? Like I'm asking my boss to give me the money in advance. Like I'm telling Hashem, like, give me everything in advance and then I'll serve you, right? The second idea is that of the zillionaire, we like to call it around here. And again, this, these are not going to be the words that are going to be used in the text exactly, but I'm just giving it to you like that. So it sticks. Okay. So the boss, right? The zillionaire, which meaning the person who is seeking a collateral from God that has neither limit or measure. Why doesn't it have limit or measure, limit or measure? Because we don't know how much that amount is. Like, how could you calculate how much you're going to need for the rest of your life? If, first of all, you don't even know what the rest of your life means. Like, what is that timeline, right? And for you yourself, your children, your spouse, your dependents, you don't know who those people are, how long they're going to live, how much they're going to need, right? The, there's no limit, right? So normally the value, we think the value of a collateral, right? Something that we take, right? to guarantee a loan, right? Um, it's usually commensurate with the amount of the debt, right? But here it's like, we're demanding collateral that doesn't have a limit or measure. Because again, there's no limit to what I'm seeking from Hashem, because I don't know how much money will be enough to sustain me and the members of my household for the household for their food and all their other needs until the debt, until the days that we all leave this world, right? So even as the person, if the person has zillions, right? A number that is like a ridiculous number, right? Or even many more than that, right? He's not going to be at ease because the end is concealed. It's completely, we don't know what that end is. What's that end point? We don't know the end. We don't know the length of our days, right? So it is foolish to seek such collateral because it has no limit or measure, right? So this is, so the boss, right? Is like asking the boss, asking the boss to pay us in advance. The zillionaire is asking for collateral that has no limit or measure, right? And then the third point that he's going to tell us here is about being indebted. So boss, cillionaire, indebted. What does indebted mean? This is actually a very, very, again, very logical. Again, it's, it's so incredible because as we are learning the book, we realize how logical this is. But until Rabbi Nubachia has, has pointed it out to us and kind of grabs, catches us in the way we think mistakenly, right? Do we realize how faulty our logic is? And how logical bitachon is actually, right? So it's actually very, very interesting. It's one of the most fascinating things about this book. It's like, oh, how does how does he know that we think like that? So how, does, how does he know that my that, how faulty my logic is? And how does he have such logical arguments to show me how silly I am or I've been or I can be, right? So number three, indebted. So the show me the money mentality. The third problem is saying, demanding collateral from Hashem to, to whom I am already indebted. Think about it. I can only demand collateral from a debtor, right? 
if I don't already owe him any money, then maybe I'm justified to demand some collateral, right? Right. Okay. So I, you want me to lend you some money, right? Let's say you want me to give you something. I'm, I'm, you want me to give you a, make you give you a loan, right? So give me collateral in case you are not going to pay me the loan. Now, if, if I owe him money, how can I ask him to give me collateral, right? If I currently have outstanding debts that I owe to that other party and they're legitimate debts, then it makes absolutely no sense for me to request collateral from this person that I'm going to give a loan to, right? It, it's not, even if he volunteered to give me that collateral, it's ridiculous. I already owe the guy money, right? So it makes no sense to demand collateral from somebody to whom I already am indebted. So now we can see, knowing what we know about Hashem, that it's obviously, this applies even more so to the creator of the world, right? I can't demand collateral, meaning I can't demand my wealth in advance. Give it to me now, right? Right, because I don't know if you're gonna give it to me in the future. So give me all my future needs now, and then I'll serve you, right? I'm asking for collateral now. How can I demand collateral from God when I know that I have many, 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 many legitimate debts that I owe him, right? If I internalize everything that greater has been given me from the, from the day I took my first breath, right? I'm indebted to him. I'm constantly indebted to him. How could I even have the chutzpah to ask, right? So if it were possible to add all of the good deeds, even of, the, of, 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 of all the people throughout history, all right, and consider it as though we could like, you know, gather it all up as if one person did all of these good deeds, would that still be enough to repay God for even one kindness that he does for one of us? No, Right. Absolutely no, because kindness, we, it's, it's completely infinite. So how could I have the chutzpah and the, the shame? Like it's, 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 it's like I have no shame to ask my creator to give me great favors in advance of me serving him. By the way, in addition to all the favors that he's already given me in the past, right? Right? And then he gives us another very beautiful point when he's talking about indebtedness, right? Being indebted. He talks about, this is actually phenomenal. He says, do you, and he, he gives it like, he's going to enter, he's going to put a little story here to, to bring this point, but I'm just going to give you the point before we read the story. The point is that he shares with us is would God demand us to fulfill our obligations to him for tomorrow, today for tomorrow? Meaning does God tell us on the first of the month, give me 90 prayers, Right. Give me 30 days of three prayers three times a day. Of course not, right? Not for, to, not for, not for tomorrow, not for a year from now. Not, not, no, no, no service in the future is God demanding today. God doesn't demand today any of the service in the future, right? And, and, and if, we, if, if he did, could we agree to that? We couldn't agree to that, right? Because how can God demand that I fulfill my future obligations today when who knows if I am even going to be alive in the future, right? So I can only be obligated to in a defined amount of service during the present time, just right now. And only when I reach the future, will I be obligated to the service of that future time, which then will be the present, right? So it's the same idea. The creator guarantees my sustenance for the present time. And in return, it is incumbent upon me to fulfill a service at the present time today. So just like God does not demand for me to serve him before it is time, right? So too, I shouldn't demand that God provide for me sustenance for the future before that time has even arrived, right? So why are we doing that? Why is this person, again, we're debunking this show me the money mentality. Show it to me now, right? I'm going to take it as collateral because you're not going to give it to me in the future. I don't know if you're going to give it to me in the future. Show me the money now, right? How could I ask him for that when I'm not even going to know if I'm going to be alive then, okay? So that's number three. Then, then we get into number four, which is what we call 
the credit score. So we did boss, which is asking for your boss for salary before we did in debt. We did um, zillionaire, right? Um, he's asking for an unlimited amount of money indebted. We're, we're indebted to Hashem, right? And yet we're asking collateral from step from, from the person who we were indebted to. It's absolutely ridiculous. Right. And then we just, and now we're going to do credit score. So what is the credit score referred to? The, it's referring to the fact that we are treating God as though he had, as though we treat human beings, right? We, we, we're going to do a transaction that we're going to make a loan to somebody and we look at their credit worthiness, right? We look at their credit score, their ability to pay us back, right? And based on that ability, we, we will determine whether we're going to take collateral or how much collateral we're going to take, right? Because there are going to be three concerns the author is going to tell us. In the normal world, right, usually we take collateral when we're concerned that the person is not going to have the ability to pay us because they're going to become impoverished and they're not going to have the money to pay us. We might be concerned that the person might intentionally refuse to pay us, right? Or we might be concerned that the person might pass away or be unable to, you know, to pay us for some reason, maybe can find us, right? Can disappear on us, right? So given these three reasons, we typically take collateral, right? Collateral is sort of like mitigates these risks, the risk of the person disappearing or dying or refusing or just not having the money, right? But if I had all the confidence in my friend whom I'm about to lend money, right? If I had all the confidence in him and, and these concerns weren't real concerns to me, obviously I wouldn't ask them for collateral, right? So all the more so, when it comes to the creator of the world with, to whom neither of these concerns are applicable. Hashem is not going anywhere. Hashem is not losing his ability to pay. And Hashem is not going to refuse to pay, right? So it's disgraceful and shameful that we should ask collateral in advance, okay? We're good up to here? Okay. Then number five, and again, we're going to read it in sight, but this is just to get us in the mindset of what's happening when we get to the lang language. Okay. The, the fifth um, rebuttal, let's say here is a false claim. What is the false claim? It's basically, we are, this person is compromising their feelings of peace and serenity that he actually really desires because he's collateral is supposed to give again mitigate those risks that we just talked about right but it's supposed to, to it's supposed to also it's supposed to provide this person with some peace of mind since he's going to give a loan and he could use this collateral to to get his money back in the event that he doesn't get repaid right he could use the collateral as payment for the debt that is owed to him or he by selling it by swapping it whatever right right and he'll use that uh, as payment right so that gives him some sense of peace, of security, right? And here the person says, wealth, giving me the wealth now is going to give me that piece of security. But the reality is that it's a false claim. To say that the wealth gives a person peace of mind is actually quite faulty. We already learned it. We already learned it throughout the entire safer, right? We, we, if, if I have all the money in the world, I still can't be confident that I will have it always in my possession, right? I think we covered this in chapter two. Um, something might happen to, to it or something might happen to me, right? The money could leave me or I could leave the money, right? So it's not true that the money is what gives us peace of mind. Spoiler alert to this guy who doesn't understand that, but the only thing that actually gives him peace of mind is trusting in Hashem right? That, that which he's seeking, he's looking for it in the wrong place. It's a completely faulty logic. It's a false claim to think that obtaining the material riches, the material wealth is going to give him inner peace, right? Because in, like he told us earlier in the Safer, in the book, he told us it could actually be his down. This is his downfall. It could actually be a significant cause of troubles and grief and stress. Okay. So that's number five. Then there's the idea of double pay. This is actually really nice. Okay. This is the idea that I'm undermining my chances 
of earning an infinite reward that I could be earning by trusting Hashem. Meaning if like this, if I, if I were sure that my friend is going to repay his debt before it's due date, and he would even pay me more, let's say double the amount that he owes me, right? In return for me waiting, right? For me waiting patiently, then I'm never going to demand collateral, right? I'm going to wait because I'm completely sure that he is going to pay me even before the debt is due. And he's going to give me, give me even more than what he owes me. I'm not going to nudge him. And I'm not, I'm going to wait patiently. I'm not going to demand collateral, right? And here I'm speaking about God Almighty, right? If I actually understand, if I know, I know his good conduct towards me. I know his kindness, right? I know his abundant kindness, right? Not just now, not just in recent times, but in the past, from the beginning, right? And that God repays me for my acts of charity and of service and all the good deeds that I do with rewards, not just here, but also in the world to come with rewards that we've talked about before. We can't even grasp. Like I was, I was actually talking to the high school girls. I was in Chicago recently and I spoke to the high school girls. I say, I, 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 I told them, I have no idea, right? Like if you had given me a notebook, blank notebook at 12 years old, and you had told me, yeah, L, design your, design your life, right? Design your best life. Would I even be able to design the life that I've been given? Would I even understand, right? I wouldn't have the capacity. I don't have the vision. I don't understand all the blessings. I wouldn't have even be able to, to put it together. What do I know? I'm so limited, right? So we have no idea, right? We can't grasp with our limited human intellect how much bounty God is giving us. We, we really can't grasp it, right? Hashem's kindness is completely unlimited. So it's a total disgrace if I demand collateral from him, okay? So then the last one, and that's how he ends the chapter, is the idea of being clueless, okay? It just basically having a show me the money mentality shows that I am just clueless. I don't get how this works, right? Because my ability to repay God's kindness in the future is dependent on him, on God himself giving me life. So I don't really have any control over my ability to repay him. I'm not assured that I will be able to repay him. So I'm me saying, give me, give it to me now. And then in the future, I'm going to repay you. But guess what? My future depends only on him. I have zero control over whether I am going to be breathing and alive in an hour from today, in a minute from today, right? And from now, in a minute from now, right? So I, it's absolutely clueless for me to even, to even conceive of that, that, that show me the money mentality, right? I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay God my debts because I depend on him for my very life right? Even a perfectly righteous individual cannot repay God for all the good that he bestows upon him, right? Without Hashem uh, helping him, right? We all need Hashem. Like sometimes I think about when we say Shemona Esri and we, 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 we say to Hashem, to Hashem, open my lips, right? So I once heard this beautiful idea, like, oh my goodness, I can't even open my, it's not even, it's yes, it's the idea that Hashem should open my lips that I should be able to articulate, right? And really be honest about what I'm articulating, but, but I can't even open my lips without God's help, right? Right. And we wake up in the morning and we say, thank you for all these things. I cannot do anything without God, right? So imagine how it applies, right? This is a righteous person can't even repay God for all the good that he did. So imagine us average people, right? Who needs every help from Hashem every single moment and to do every single mitzvah, how could we even claim that we're going to pay him in the future, right? It shows that we're completely clueless about how this works. And the way it works is God gives you life. So you have no idea what's happening. Okay. So up to here, we have a pretty good overview about what we are going to look inside. Now let's look at page our uh, page, the beginning of chapter six, which is going to be page 222. Okay, so the previous chapter, 
concluded with the attitude of a person who lacks bitachon in regards to his duties towards God. Such a person will first ensure that all his needs are met, and only then will he contemplate his duties towards Hashem. This chapter will post seven responses to such a person, illustrating how foolishly mistaken he, mistaken he is to delay paying his obligations, which are Torah mitzvahs, until he has material prosperity, right? So we've been created here to do something in the world. We're giving a soul every single morning. We're given a body. We're giving all the resources, all the capacity. And we say, no, actually, I'm not going to take care of any of that, right? You first show me the money. Okay, let's see. I have seen that it is necessary to expose with seven points the foolishness and errors of those people who engage in this way of thinking. Although we will need to elaborate on this, it is nonetheless important to do so because the following seven points contain substance with which to embarrass and rebuke the people who have this way of thinking. So he's going to totally like crush us here. These people are called the sect of owners of security pledges, right? They're the people who want a, a collateral. They want a security pledge. They don't trust that God will take care of them. So they take a security pledge from him, a guarantee that if they live a long time, they will have what they need. Only when they have their security pledge in hand, meaning that they feel confident of having enough wealth for the rest of their lives, do they turn to give God what they owe him, namely the observance of mitzvahs. Their conduct towards God is akin to a merchant who sells on credit to a person whom he doesn't trust to pay, right? When do we take collateral? Again, when we are going to extend a loan, right, extend a line of credit to somebody that we don't know if they can pay. So to mitigate the risk of us not getting paid in the future, when that loan becomes due, we take collateral, we take a security. He therefore takes a security pledge at the time of the sale out of fear that the buyer can't be trusted or that the buyer won't be able to pay for the merchandise that he purchased. The person who concerns himself with his obligations only after he has material prosperity doesn't trust that God will pay him in return for his service of God. And he therefore takes a security pledge from him in advance, or he wants to take a security pledge. Okay, so what is the flaw? What are the flaws here? The first flaw, the first response, right? The first, the flaws in asking God for collateral. The first response, which we say to such a person, and this is going to be what I called boss before, right? Dealing with your boss. You're a person who doubts if all a person's needs have been preordained by the decree of the creator and who doesn't believe in the greatness of God's strength and ability. You're a person whose light of intellect has been darkened and whose candle of understanding has been extinguished due to the darkness of your desires overcoming you, right? You become so greedy that you lost sight of what, what's really happening here. You're just not getting it, man, right? <laughs> the only reason why a person denies God's power is because he gives in to his, his desires. In truth, it should be apparent that all of a person's needs are in the hands of God, right? But we lose sight of that. We forget that God is actually giving us everything we need at every single moment. Surely it is only appropriate for you to request and take a security pledge from your fellow or friend who has no jurisdiction over you and cannot give you orders. Right? You take it from somebody who, like, who's not your boss, right? However, it is not appropriate for a paid worker who is hired by people to take a security pledge for his pay from his employer before he begins his work. That's just not the way it works. You don't just say, yeah, like, give me my salary now. I'm going to work for you. I'm gonna give it to me now, and then I'll work for you, Right. All the more so will a servant not take a security pledge from his master for his livelihood before he has begun to work for his master. And all the more so that a created being will not take a security pledge from his creator before he even begins serving him. It is astonishing because even when a servant serves his master with the intention of being rewarded after his work, it is considered improper as the rabbi said in the Mishnah, do not be like servants who serve their master in order to receive reward. So again, e even, even the idea of us serving Hashem in, in order to get something in exchange is quite ridiculous, right? What, what is this? It's, this, is, this, is not, this is not a relationship like that. This is not how we nurture a relationship. You don't do, you don't do for your spouse. You don't do for your children. You don't do for your friend so that you could get something in return, right? 
you do, you give of yourself because you're in a relationship because you care about each other. Right. And Hashem is constantly giving you, he's called, he's your father in heaven, showering you constantly with blessings, right? He's your loving father. Like we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't even have that mentality, but okay. Okay. If we have it, but, 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 but he's saying like, it's even more astonishing to have, it's astonishing to have that mentality, but of course it's even worse to, to say, okay, give me the money in advance and then I'll serve you. But okay. If we serve him wanting, wanting to benefit, it's already improper. We should not have that mentality. All the more so it is improper when the servant is so brazen faced that he asks for a security pledge for his livelihood before he begins his work. Similarly, the verse states, is this how you repay the Lord, you disgraceful and wise people? Okay. Now let's talk about the zillionaire. That's the second response. The second response to the person without bitachon. Usually when a person takes security pledge from his friend, the value of the security pledge is limited according to the amount of the debt, right? We take a pledge that is going to help us repay the amount of the loan, right? Or the line of credit that we're extending. However, the person who has the way of thinking mentioned above, meaning the show me the money mentality, has no end to what he seeks from God because he doesn't know how much money will be enough to sustain him and the members of his household for their food and other needs until the days of their death, right? So it's not, it's not the value of the security that he's demanding is it, ridiculous, right? It's endless. Even were he to have many times more money than that which in truth would be enough for him, his mind will not be at rest because their end is concealed and the length of their days is unknown. He's never going to know what is enough. Because he's never known to know when is his last day? When are his descendants last day? Right, right. So he doesn't know when it is. So it's never going to be enough. That's why it's zillions, right? It's an endless number of money, amount of money that he's asking for. He is a fool for seeking that which he does because it has neither limit nor measure. Then comes number three, which is what we called indebted. The third response to such a person, again, the person who asks, who had to show me the money mentality, a person who takes a security pledge from his friend will only take a security pledge from him if he does not have any outstanding debts that he owes this friend. And if he didn't borrow money from him at an earlier point in time, only then is he justified in his request for a security pledge. Right? We said it before. How could I, how could I ask you for collateral if I owe you money? <laughs> However, if he, has an, uh, if he has outstanding debts that he owes his friend and he is aware that he has these legitimate debts, then it makes no sense whatsoever for him to request a security pledge from his friend, nor would it be befitting, would it be fitting for him to take the security pledge from his friend, even if the latter volunteered to give it to him. It makes no sense to take a security pledge from someone to whom you owe money. It is for this reason that it makes no sense to take a security pledge from God. All the more so does this apply to the creator, a security pledge should not be demanded of him because a person has many legitimate debts that he owes the creator. And we know it. We owe him so much. Were it possible to add up all the good deeds of all the people throughout history together and to consider it as if one person performed all of them, those good deeds would not be enough to repay God for even one kindness that he bestows upon him. How then is this brazen faced person not embarrassed to ask the creator to give him great favors in advance of his service of God, in addition to those favors that he has given him in the past, right? So not only am I asking, I'm asking for, for I'm, I'm asking for money in advance of what I'm, the service that I'm going to do in the future, but already God has given me so much. Not only is, not only is he going to continue to give me, but God is, God has given me so much. I am so indebted to him. How could I do such a thing? Surely his debt toward his creator will weigh down on him. And perhaps he will not be able to fulfill his promise to serve him because his days will end and his time will come. So now he's going to give us the example, the story that I told you about to communicate, communicate the idea, um, the idea of being indebted and how God doesn't ask us to serve him today um, for future service to pay him today for future service. So there was once a pious man who would proclaim to his fellow people, 
people. It is conceivable that the creator would demand of is it is it conceivable that the creator would demand of you today to fulfill the obligations of tomorrow or that or that which you are obligated to do afterwards in a year or two from now, right? That's what I told you before. Like, is it conceivable for God to ask me on the first of the month, give me 90 prayers, right? That what did the people replied? They replied, how would it be conceivable that I would be demanded? It would be demanded from us to fulfill future obligations today when we don't know if we will live to reach those days when we will become obligated to fulfill them. However, we can be obligated in a defined amount of service during the present time. And only when we reach the future time will we become obligated in the service of that time. The pious man, man then said to them, similarly, the creator, may he be blessed, has guaranteed your present sustenance for the present time. And in return, it is incumbent upon you to fulfill a set service of God. Just as he will never demand his service of you before its time, so too it is fitting that you have shame and refrain for ask, from asking for sustenance before its time arrives. Why then do I see you asking him for the sustenance of the years to come when you don't even know if you, you will live until then? Furthermore, you even ask that he give you in advance the sustenance for your future wife and children to be who haven't even been born yet. Additionally, you don't you do not merely ask for food, but you ask for food as well as for other excess desires for those times that are not yet unknown to you, the future, even though you're not guaranteed to still be alive during those times. Not only do you not serve him in lieu of his guarantee to provide for you in the future, you don't even make an accounting with yourself regarding that which you have ignored, the service of God during the past days, during which he did not neglect to provide you fully with your sustenance. So he had he had he never neglected you, right? And you're not even realizing the um, the death that you owe him, right? So just to clarify, we're when we're talking about this show me the money person, we're talking about the mentality. We're not talking here about the fact that, yes, we have a mitzvah to pray and we should pray for all our needs and we pray daily for our needs, right? At the same time that we recognize that God gives us all of our needs and everything. If I have it, it's because I need it, right? That's what we learned in the Shabbi Tachon. We're talking about the person who is consumed with the worries of the future, Right. And saying, give me now and then to consume to the extent that they say, I'm going to take care of Torah mitzvahs and of my spiritual life and of fulfilling my soul's mission later, because right now I just need to know that you are taking care of me, Hashem. Right. And it's like, what do you mean? What have I been doing since day one? Right. Can, right. Right. So again, this is talking about the person, the show me the money mentality, the person that is so concerned with his future and his family's future. Right. And that's all he's so concerned about. He doesn't have time for anything else. He is actually and he is demanding of God that he show it to him now. And then right. Once I have the money, then I'll take care of Shabbos. Once I have everything I need for my entire for generations, then I'll stop working on Saturday. Right. Then I'll whatever, right? Whatever it is, fill in the blanks. Then I'll give charity, right? Once I have all the money, I hear this a lot. Once I have all the money, then come talk to me about charity. And it's like, actually, if you only realize that's, that's not how it works, my friend, right? That's just not how it works. Okay, so that's what we're debunking here. Number four, credit score. Okay, well, let me read what it says here. Although the person without Bitachon failed to fulfill his responsibilities towards God, God nevertheless provided him with sustenance. It would therefore behoove him at the very least to repent for his failure to repay God through serving him, right? So at the very least, for the fact that God already provided for him, he should at least serve him. Like it's quotes about to say, no, I'm not going to serve you because you have to be, like, at least serve him for like just, just the fact that you already owe him, right? Credit score, number four. The fourth response to such a person, again, the show me the money mentality person, a person who takes a security pledge from his friend does so for one of three reasons. Remember, I told you there's three reasons why you we would get, we could conceive of getting collateral from, from somebody. Number one, out of concern that perhaps his friend will become poor and hence unable to pay his debt, right? Then it would be reasonable to ask for collateral. Number two, out of a concern that perhaps he will intentionally refuse to pay his debt. Okay. 
Number three, perhaps his friend will die or be unable to find him. The security pledge is widely considered to be a remedy for all these problems, right? It's a risk mitigator. There's these risks. We're going to mitigate the risk by asking for collateral. These reasons apply only to humans. It applies to us. But with God, none of these reasons apply, right? So it makes no sense for us to ask for collateral. If people were to be confident with each other insofar as these three concerns, it would without a doubt be considered a disgrace for them to take security pledges from the, each other, right? If I trusted you and I know you're not going to disappear on me and I know that you're not going to become impoverished and not pay me, you're going to figure it out, right? I wouldn't ask for collateral. All the more so, it comes to the creator, may he be blessed, regarding whom these traits are not applicable at all. God is not going anywhere. God is not using losing his ability to pay, right? And to sustain us. And he's not refusing to sustain us. So what are we doing here? It is even more disgraceful and astonishing that people should take security pledges from God. Number five. Number five is the false claim. Let's, let's introduce it by saying what it says right here. Therefore, it makes no sense to take a security pledge from God by making efforts to amass wealth for the in-person's entire life. Instead, he should trust that God will provide for him when the time chooses. So what's now number five? Number five is going to be the false claim or the faulty logic, the claim, the claim that, that the money, that the money, the amassing the wealth now, that's going to make give me peace of mind. The peace, the fifth response. A security, a, a person takes a security pledge from his friend to have peace of mind, since he plans on using the pledge as payment for the debt that is owed to him to benefit from it or to sell it or swap it and use the money or object he receives in return as payment for the debt that is owed to him. However, the claim of a person who thinks that he will have peace of mind from the worries of this world if the creator gives him his needs in advance is false because he cannot be confident that the money will remain in his possession like we said before either he leaves the money or the money could leave him either way like there's no guarantee that you're going to have this money so what are you feeling so confident about here like that's not the source of tranquility at all for mishap might possibly happen to him that will separate him from the money a person who has amassed great wealth is still not guaranteed peace of mind because it is possible that he will lose his money Furthermore, as the author continues, even if he holds on to his wealth, it is possible that he will not have peace of mind, right? There's many people who have tremendous amounts of money and they're still a nervous wreck. They're constantly worried. So again, having money is not, um, is not directly related with serenity. Not at all. Not at all. You could have money and be serene if you have a lot of bitachon. And you could have very little money and be very serene. Again, if you have bitachon, like it has nothing to do with the amount of money in the bank it's all a fallacy because it's all it's all nourish guide like it's not it's not real right the only reality is hashem so the only peace and serenity that a person has is to live with hashem to have a, that, a godly consciousness con consciousness and be constantly trying to connect to his creator that gives a person a sense of a true sense of, of of serenity otherwise you're just fooling yourself you're actually a basket case and we know it that which they claim regarding the peace of mind they will have when they obtain the riches of the world that they desire is a false claim. And it is foolish of them to seek this because it is possible that the riches themselves will be a significant cause of their troubles and grief. It's a shame, but sometimes it happens, right? As the rabbi said, a person who increases possessions increases worries, right? Sometimes you have so much that you actually become a basket case over all of it. As the Mishnah attest, a person's wealth can be the cause of his stress. So even if he doesn't lose the money, it is still foolish to think that he will have peace of mind as a result. There is no direct correlation between the money, the wealth, the assets, the bank account, and peace of mind. And whoever thinks there is, is actually fooling themselves, and they're going to have a terrible wake up call at some point, right? And they're going to then wonder why did I waste so much time, right? Chasing something that I'm never going to arrive at if I chase it there, if I look for it there, right? It's somewhere else, my friend. It's in like I told you last week, there's only one address, you'd cave up K, right? So it's it's somewhere else. And we're we're chasing for it in the wrong place, which is in the in the in the bank accounts and in the money and the dollar bills. Okay. So the last, the, not the last one, the second to last one, the sixth is double paid. This is a sixth rebuttal. The sixth person to such, the sixth response, sorry. The sixth response to such a person, the person with the show me the money mentality is as follows. 
were the person who is taking the security pledge from his friend to be sure that his friend will repay his debt before its due date and would pay him double the amount that he owes him in return for his waiting as a kindness towards him, then he would certainly never take the security pledge from him, right? If we knew he's going to pay us ahead of time and he's going to pay us even more, we're not going to ask for collateral, right? We know he's going to pay us. And here we are speaking of the creator, may he be blessed, about whom we know of his good conduct with us and his abundant kindness to, all, to us, both recently as well as in the past, and that he repays us for our acts of charity and service with a reward that cannot be grasped by human intellect and certainly cannot be articulated. Like I said before, we can't even grasp the level of blessing that we all have, right? Since God's kindness to us is unlimited, it is even more of a great disgrace if we were to take a security pledge from him. Now comes the last one, which is what we called clueless. So the seventh response to such a person, a person who takes a security pledge from his friend only takes the pledge if he's able to supply his friend with merchandise that corresponds to the value of the security pledge. However, a person who takes a security pledge from the creator, may he be blessed, by requesting God's kindness in advance of fulfilling his obligations towards him, does not have the capability to repay with his service of God because he's not even assured that he will be able to repay his old debts, all the more so that he can't be assured that he will be able to pay back the new debt, meaning the security, right? The collateral. For even a righteous man would not be able to repay God for the good that he has bestowed upon him were it not for God's helping him. So he's completely clueless again because he doesn't understand how it, how it works. You can't take one breath without God, right? You are not going to be able to pay your debt. Don't fool yourself and say, I'm going to pay this debt, right? Give it to me now and I'll get back to you. I'll serve you. Just give it to me now so that I know I'm taken care of and then I'll serve you. I'm never going to serve you, right? That's not how it works because I depend on Hashem. I can't say I'm going to serve you later. I don't know later. When, when is later? How do I know when I'm going to get to it? You don't. You don't because we depend on God, right? An average person might not be able to repay God for his kindness. Furthermore, even a righteous person needs help from God to serve him. This being the case, it makes no sense for a person to request the kindness of God in advance because it is unlikely that he will be able to capable of repaying it. As one of the pious men said in his praises of Hashem, even the intellectual who knows you does not glory in his actions. Rather, he praises your name and your mercy because you prepared his heart so that it is able to know you for through you and your help, all the children of Israel will be found to be righteous and praised, saying, we have gloried in God all day long and we will forever praise your name. Even the righteous need God's help to be righteous and know him. All the more so does an average person need, need God's help to fulfill the mitzvahs. So how can we say, I'm going to do my mitzvahs later, right? When like, no, like you, you don't know if you're going to be around later. You need God's help at every single moment. So these are the seven responses to the show me the money mentality. Okay. And there's a summary right here, but I think we've covered them between the fact that we reviewed them um, beforehand and we just cover them we cover them extensively um and like i said it's a beautiful chapter because it it again it's so logical and we would never i don't know that we would on our own come to these this understanding i know that i wouldn't have like until i read this i don't know that i actually had the awareness right of how silly sometimes we are in terms of you know kind of like kind of adopting that show me the money mindset. And, 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 you know, maybe it's not your particular case, but I've certainly been exposed to this type of, of mentality. Um, and I don't think it's, it's, it's something that, that we don't see. We actually see it quite, quite often, right? Where people are just on this treadmill to give it to me now, give it to me now. Uh, no, I can't, I can't go daven. I can't go pray. I can't do not, none of this, none of this because, because, because why? Because I need it right now, right? Because my material concerns are the only thing that I'm concerned about. And I need that God, I need it right now. And then maybe I will consider, right? Um, 
So I think it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful reminder. And then I, what I wanted to do also, since, since we have extra time, I just came across um, a little story that was talking about the idea of um, this week's Parsha actually has so much to do with Bitachon, but just one little point that just came into my inbox recently from Rabbi Biderman about the spies, right? Moshe Rabbeinu sent spies to sp scout the land and it ends up being a terrible mistake because the spies, um, 10 out of the 12 spies, um, come back with a negative report. They were just sent to scout the land, not to give an opinion on the land. And they came, they panicked. They got consumed by fear, which is something we learned about that the Beis Alevi, when we learned the Beis Alevi on Bitachon talks about fear. Um, and he might even give mention of the spies. I'm not sure. He talks, he has definitely a lot on fear, uh, at least one chapter on fear that we that I remember on the Maimar and Bitachon. But basically the spies became overwhelmed with fear about the, uh, the land, the inhabitants of the land, and they came to a conclusion that they are not, they won't be able to conquer the land. So it was, that was a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. And that conclusion created a complete state of panic amongst the Jewish people. And they immediately were crying um, and they were in a complete state of panic. And we know that that was the first of the horrible events that have befallen our nation on Tisha B'Av. It was the, nine of, uh, the ninth day of, the, of Av that this tragedy of the, um, of the negative report of the spies and the panic of the Jewish people happened. So um, here there was a little story that Rabbi... Rabbi Binderman was sharing about the idea that, you know, that they, they cried for no reason, because really, there was no reason to cry and panic. Because Hashem had already told us that we were going to enter the land, we had seen miracles, we we had all the evidence in the world that we could conquer the land. The idea wasn't to go and scout the land to come up with a conclusion whether we can conquer the land or not. The fact that we're going to conquer the land is already a given, right? We were just going to see what is the lay of the land to see, strategize which, which way we go about. But it wasn't about whether we're conquering it or not. So we start crying for no reason. And because of that, we have been for generations crying for no for crying, right? We, it gave us it gave us a tremendous amount to cry about, right? We we are still we are still paying the consequences of 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 that mistake, and so Rabbi Binderman was saying in the name of the Imre Emes that the opposite is also true. That when one is happy for no reason or seemingly for no reason, that also results in joy. But in this case, enjoy enjoy for salvation, meaning that we see, like we actually get to see the more from more the abundance and the 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 the, the open hand of Hashem. So basically, we're saying like laugh and be happy, even if you think you have no reason to be happy, because that in turn is going to return to to um, generate many more reasons to be happy. It's the flip side of they cried for no reason and then generated actually reasons to cry about had they no cried and complained like we wouldn't be stuck in this place right so the re the way he illustrated this was with a story from the from the Ruziner, and he said that there was a wealthy man um who was going through hard times and he was fetching and he fetch about his problems right the, the typical response that we often see right and in, in, this is the story. It's a story. The story says, okay, so he fetch about his problems. So in Hashem, in, in heaven, they saw that he's only moaning and complaining. They said, okay, you think this is bad? Okay, we will show you what is negative, right? Do you think this is something to complain about? We're going to show you what to complain about. So then he lost. He was first complaining about his financial situation. Then he actually lost all his money. And then he had to go collect door to door. And of course, he moaned about his bitter situation. And in heaven, they saw him moaning and complaining, right? And they said, oh, you think this is bad? We're going to show you what is not good, right? And then he was, uh, he, he got a disease, I think. So he got like some sort of leprosy or something that made him very like, 
Like he, it was just, people didn't want to see him. Like he became physically ill in some way that people didn't want to relate to him because it was, they were afraid it was contagious or whatever. So then he didn't have the ability to collect money. So first it was collecting money. That was pretty bad. Now he can't even collect the money and he's still complaining and complaining, right? And he's falling lower and lower. And in heaven, they see that he's still complaining and complaining. And they said, okay, you think this is negative? Let me show you what's actually, what's actually something to complain about. So then he became a hunchback. And because he was a hunchback, I think he couldn't eat or something. And at that point, things are so bad that suddenly this guy like woke up to the reality and he said, well, at least I'm alive, right? Baruch Hashem, I'm alive. Thank God I'm alive, right? Many people in my situation are not even alive, right? So I'm alive. And it's like his own, his whole uh, tune changed. He flipped his melody, right? And now instead of complaining, he... For once in, in, a, in a, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a while, for once he finally, after all that, he started praising Hashem and recognizing, oh, I'm alive, right? There is always something to praise Hashem for. And there's infinite to praise Hashem. Okay, but like, if you actually look, right, this guy hadn't even noticed anything. So now he says, ah, oh, Baruch Hashem, I'm alive. And at that moment in, in heaven, they said, ah, you think that your life situation is good? Let us show you what is good. And then his hunchback was healed and he was able to eat in the regular way. And now he was very happy. And then he thanked Hashem and he said, wow, I've been healed, right? I've been healed. Thank you, Hashem, for my salvation. So then they said in heaven, they said, oh, you think that this is good? Let me, sh let us show you what is good. And then he was not just that he was healed from the hunchback situation, but he was actually healed from his uh, leprosy or whatever this contagious disease he had. And now he could actually collect door to door again. So actually he had a source to actually, not only could he eat, he was alive and he could eat and he got to collect money, right? And he said, thank you, Hashem, right? He praised Hashem that he was able to have, to, to, to do something that he was taken away from him. And they say, ah, praising you, you 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 see that this is good let us show you what is good right and then a wealthy man came and lent him a large sum of money and he invested the money and he became wealthy again right and it says that the Rujiner told this story to his daughter because he heard his daughter fetch and he said don't fetch don't moan because one fetch one complain brings next one and the next one whereas one joyful comment and one praise and one act of good one recognition acknowledgement of gratitude brings more of that brings more happiness and goodness so i thought that was a beautiful story to kind of close off the kind of show me mentality guy who is that guy who we ended up in chapter five as uh, if you remember the person who is completely dissatisfied right um so you know in life we have a tremendous amount to be grateful for. And it's really focus. It's what we focus on. And the more we focus on the good that we have, the more good actually we're going to see. That's what the story is teaching us. Uh, so it's all what we're focusing. So let, the idea is to focus on the good and not, God forbid, make the mistake of the miraglim to focus and panic, right? To focus on what seems to not be good, what seems to not be possible, lose sight of Hashem, who is a kol yachol, who can do every, anything, who, um, who is infinite and, and uh, lose sight of that and fall into despair like that happened to the Miraglim, to the spies and the Jews in the desert. So any questions, any comments on anything that we covered today or any, any other, any stories or anything to share? No, we're good? Amazing. Okay, we're good. And it was clear, right? We got the seven points. We debunked it. Okay, so that's not us. We don't have the show the money, show me the money mentality. We don't, we certainly don't have it. At least, uh, you know, if we had a little bit of it, we after today, we don't have it anymore. So have a good Shabbos, everyone. Uh, okay, you enjoyed Bailey. Very good. Okay, good. Um, so have a good Shabbos. And I will see you again next week, God willing. Okay, good Bye. Shabbos, everybody. Good to see you.